Thanks for joining us on the Cultured Meat and Future Food Show. We're really excited to have Doug Grant of Atlantic Fish Co. Uh, on the show today. Doug, welcome to the show. Hey, it's great to be here. Doug, I'm really excited to dig into many different topics, especially since you are a fellow podcaster yourself. But before we even get into that, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. Pre-podcast, it's it's like I said, it's it's great to be on, and I know we initially got engaged through the podcast. But my my background was in the Navy for for ten years. I was a helicopter pilot, relocated here to DC with the Navy, and got really interested in tech and startups, and I've been involved in a couple other startups. Nothing to do with food, nothing to do with biotech, but things with like software and healthcare, and then ultimately got interested in cultivated meat. And here we are. Very cool. Did you say helicopter pilot? Yeah, yeah. I was in the Navy for 10 years. So I was did most of my operational work out in San Diego. We were talking about before we started recording. Lived out on the West Coast for, for several years before uh, relocating here. Wow, cool. Okay. And, and I'm sure the, the Navy fleet helicopters are very different, but... I have heard that flying a helicopter is one of the most difficult things you could fly. Is is that true? Yeah, I mean they train us really well, but yeah, I it is it is difficult to to fly. You get used to it after a while, though. It, it's kind of funny thinking about going back to plane. They first train you on a plane, and then they transition you over to helicopters. So actually, going back to a plane would have probably been been harder for me. But yeah, I I, I loved flying helicopters. It was it was awesome. Wow. Okay, and I guess. Would you ever want to, or do you have the opportunity to ever like do it recreationally? I haven't. Uh, you know, I've been out since 2013, and my that was my last flight. Was on a landed on an aircraft carrier in the in the Persian Gulf, and and that was it. And then came back to the states, and kind of always thought I might get back into some recreational flying, but it's really expensive, and and I think it would just be. I don't know, kind of, kind of a, a step down, <laughs> like in terms of just like right. what you're flying, you know, it's kind of like right. having a, you know, a sports car and then, and then transitioning back to, to something that's not a sports car. So right. Like uh, a Toyota Yaris of helicopters. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't, <laughs> don't want to hit on any cars. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So I can say that. <laughs> you don't know who, who's got what out there, but yeah. Yeah. So I, I never, I never really gotten back into to flying since then. I, I think I was I definitely knew I needed to find the next act in my life, which which probably, that's probably what led to this a little bit. Loved it, but but knew I didn't want to do it for my whole career, you know, doing a full 20 plus years in the Navy. Wow, cool. Well, thank you for your service. And, you know, I, I wanted to, you know, you said you moved to D- D.C. You started a podcast about cell-cultured meat, Brave New Meat. How did you first hear about cultured meat and what was your motivation to say, hey, I, I want to do this? Yeah, I think it was around 2019, and there was an article in Rolling Stone magazine about Upside Foods. You know, they were still Memphis Meats back in the day. And I was just fascinated at this from a a technology perspective. You know, I was a a lifelong meat eater. I never really considered where my food was coming from. You know, I, I had some like vague notions about cows and climate, but you know, just didn't really look under that hood at all. But I, I did think this was like pretty amazing, amazing technology. And, you know, I was always kind of looking for, you know, what's, what's around the corner. You know, I'm a, I think a techno optimist at heart and uh, started digging into it, but I'd recently started a, a, a new job and I was like, okay, I can't go too deep into this. But then COVID hit, everybody's at home. And, you know, I read Paul Shapiro's book, Clean Me. And I was also listening to your podcast and you know, I got to thinking more and more about it. And, and I, I said, you know, I want to get, I don't know if I'm ready to dive all in yet and, and like make this my career, but I want to be involved. I want to learn more. So Cold reached out to Paul. He very graciously <laughs> decided to be my first guest. And that's what led to Brave New Meat. So it was a, a COVID lockdown project that really started changing my my views on the world personally with what I eat. And then also just professionally, you know, where I wanted to put my energy going forward. Wow. That, that's cool that you said you first learned about it through a, a Rolling Stones article, because, you know, I, I saw that on the Atlantic Fish Co. website, Atlantic Fish Co. is featured in, in Rolling Stone. 
Is that right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, we we we, we had a ride up. Yeah, so it, that was very full circle. I, I remember I got the call. So we did the Indie Bio Accelerator, and uh, I'd been up in New York for our demo day, and then like the next week they. They asked me to come back up. They said, hey, they're going to feature a few of our portfolio companies in this article. And I was like, yes, I'll get the next train up. You know, so I didn't even know if like I was going to get in the article at all. But they were very, very cool. And uh, we got in and that was a very full circle moment for me. You know, like, oh, wow, we we, we read about this technology or I read about this technology in, the, in Rolling Stone. Now here I am getting uh, uh, a little bit of coverage in, in the magazine. So, yeah, that was a very serendipitous full circle type of moment for me. Wow. Okay. So, so you, you, so with the podcast, you didn't want to go too deep into the field yet. And then COVID hit. And when was it that you realized, okay, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do this with fish and it's going to be Atlantic Fish Co. When, when was that realization? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I had started a couple companies before and, you know, wasn't sure I wanted to make that level of commitment, you know? So I was like, okay, do I want to try to join one of these companies? Like, this is what I really care about. Uh, started coming to more conferences and I don't even know if you remember this, but I came out to CMS and I was like, man, I hope this guy's going to be cool about me doing another podcast on this. Inter- and you were very gracious and very nice. And, uh, I introduced myself. I don't even know. Do you remember that? I, I remember, was that, I remember you asked a question before we 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 met in person is that right yeah. yes yes yeah. i remember yeah but I, I was i was like oh man i i hope this i hope this goes over well so i was <laughs> i was nervous to meet you but thanks for being cool about everything and uh, yeah so i think i started going to conferences and i was just like meeting more and more people and you know i was like okay i think i really see a lane to to start a company here you know with something that that other folks aren't doing and I still felt like we were really, really early. So, you know, despite there being some other other companies that raised a lot of money and, you know, I felt like we were just still had a niche that we could that we could pursue and, uh, and specifically with seafood. So that's the beginning of Atlantic Fish Co., which initially was just a beta name. <laughs> we had to put something on the on the paperwork. And then I was like, OK, so far we're going to keep that. So as of now, we're, we're still Atlantic Fish Co. And I think it it resonates with where we are and, and what we're focused on with, with wild caught marine species. I, you know, I do like the name and there's something about fish co that, that, you know, some, you know, when it ends in fish co that you just think of kind of like a fresh, kind of like, a, kind of like a small seaport or, or bay town or, or something like that. So I don't know. I like the name. I hope, I hope you stick with it. What does Atlantic fish co do differently? Yeah. So I think there's, a few ways to answer that. So first with product, also with technology, and then strategy. So I'll start with product. So we are focused on white flaky marine species. You know, I think there's some companies that are doing excellent stuff with salmon and tuna and shrimp. And those are, you know, perfectly large, you know, markets for them to pursue. Makes a lot of sense. We didn't want to try to compete there. But we did see a lot of white space with white flaky fish. So that's where we wanted to focus on from a market perspective. And then also fish that can't be grown very well in aquaculture and then also very carbon intensive. So we really want to replace fish that are caught via trawling, which a lot of people don't know because seafood kind of gets a pass as a more uh, carbon friendly, climate friendly animal protein. But that masks the reality that a lot of trawling (laughs) caught species uh, are, you know, almost as carbon intensive, if not more so than beef. So from a product perspective, that's where we wanted to start. From a technology perspective, we really wanted to use bioengineering. I feel like a lot of people, and maybe, you know, just with their technology stack, this works, but people are like, we're not genetically engineering. We're not GMO. We're not, you know, doing any of these things. And and there's this belief that there is going to be more consumer acceptance for cultivated products. You know, in my opinion, you've already crossed the Rubicon if you're if you're making cultivated meat or seafood in terms of getting that adoption. Like the technique of is it been genetically engineered or not is, is sort of, you know, not the thing at that point. So, you know, we just didn't want to fight with one hand tied behind our back. So we've really doubled down and are, and are very, you know, focused on using genetic engineering from a from a technology perspective. And then lastly, from a strategy You know, when I was doing, and I know you've had a lot of these these guests on as well, there are so many companies coming in now 
that have B2B strategy. So people are doing different pieces of the tech stack. And in my mind, it, it was just crazy to try to go full stack with this. It's just a, a lot of really hard problems. And that's great. You can say, hey, we own all of the IP and we're full stack. But that just didn't seem like the way to go. So so we have found partners. You know, Our core technology is around cell line development. And that's that's really where we're we're focused. That's our wheelhouse. And then we want to work with other partners and and to get products to market faster. So you know, strategically, we've just really doubled down on on partner strategy, and I, I think that's that's been different. Very cool. Okay, and and very good point on the you know the the bioengineered or, or, or GMO kind of you know discussion here because somebody who's going to be looking for non GMO corn or non GMO carrots or whatever. They're they're not even going to be considering something like cell cultured meat, even if it is not GMO, right? I, I think I think yeah. I yeah. mean, I just I just try to like imagine the future. I'm like, who is this person that is like picking up a cultivated product in you know Whole Foods in you know five to ten years, and they're like, I'm totally on board with this, but it's genetically engineered, so I'm not going to buy it. Like I, I, I'm just very skeptical of that. I mean, I think we already just as an industry have to be like really transparent with any kind of cultivated product. But if if they're already there, like considering purchase, like, I don't know, that just seems, I don't know, that that just seems very unlikely to me that that's going to be the the deciding factor of if they're going to make a purchase decision or not. Another thing you mentioned is that you're working on, I think you said white flaky fish. Yeah. And what, what I've, uh, what I, I was, uh, I don't know who it was. I was speaking to somebody and I was talking about how it's, you know, flaky. And I think they were a non fish eater. They're like, oh, it's flaky. That's terrible. But actually, flaky is what you want when it comes to, to fish, right? And, and so maybe can you describe what that flaky texture is that you, you want to have in fish? Yeah. And, 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 and just sort of white fish in general, maybe maybe the broader category, right? Because I, I think when people sit down, if you're going to have tuna, right? Like that's a very specific experience. And if you're thinking about, especially like sushi, or if you're thinking about salmon, right? Very p- particular flavor profile, texture, color, you know, the Atlantic salmon where they, they color it with the different dyes to make it look pink, even though that's not the actual color. You know, so we're focused on, on white flesh and, and a lot of those fish are are truly flaky. So if you think about something like come from uh, Mississippi down on the Gulf Coast, you've got things like snapper or grouper. We also got some flounder. We've also been looking at uh, Atlantic sea bass and halibut. Halibut, maybe not as flaky, but definitely still in that white fish category. Uh, our view is that a lot of these are interchangeable. You know, it's what's in season, what the what the restaurants are able to to get during that quarter where it might not be in season or is or is uh, reasonably priced for them. Where they're you know they're super price sensitive. So there's a you know we're not seeing it as pursuing one species, but this whole category. You know, and and I think that that texture of of white flakiness you see that in Bronzino a lot. It's super popular in restaurants here in D.C. I think Bronzino is really come come around a lot in other parts of the country as well you know that fits into that category and it's just because it's available year round with bronzino that it's really thrived so well because they're able to farm it so that's that's the segment that we're focused on and you you mentioned that i guess aquaculture is pretty carbon intensive Uh, why is it actually carbon intensive well, so I was referring to trawling as as really carbon intensive. So this is this is species caught via bottom trawlers in the wild. Those are those are what we're really trying to displace. We actually don't want to compete with fish that are already caught in aquaculture. I, I think that's just one extra competitive challenge that is unnecessary at this point when there's there's such a wide open white space for for seafood species. I see. Okay. And, and trawling is when you go out on a boat and try to catch fish with a net. Yeah. Dragging it across the bottom. So there was a, a recent paper in nature that was describing this, all the sediment being released. So the ocean acts as a huge carbon sink. So approximately like 30%, I think of all carbon that we emit right now is, is captured via the ocean. So it's a, a huge carbon sink for us. But by disturbing this sediment with trawling, this nature paper pointed out up to 1.5 gigatons of CO2 being released into the water. And then it's a little bit unknown about how much of that is then released into the atmosphere. But, you know, effectively 
you're you're subverting our our carbon sink, which is not good right now with with climate change. So we want to focus on fish that are caught via that technique. So just for a little context, 1.5 gigatons is equivalent to all of global air travel. So we're we're talking about a, a pretty huge amount of carbon that's getting stirred up from uh, trawling techniques. Wow. Okay. Interesting. And I guess yeah, the cows get all the crew. Okay, yeah. yeah. The first on the cows, right? <laughs> there's there's there's, uh, there's other species out there that we're eating that have a have a really intensive carbon footprint. Very interesting. Okay. So so you. You joined Indie Bio. Was that you know how how long after you kind of started Atlantic Fish Co. did you join Indie Bio? Yeah, we we shopped this around as two guys with a pitch deck for a while, and and you know it was like you know trying to trying to get things going, and and then very fortunate that we got accepted into Indie Bio. This was in the the New York. There's been several companies in our industry that have gone through the program on the West Coast in San Francisco. So we were really excited to get to do this. This was really a, a catalyst for us. We plussed up our team. You know, we're able to go full time. And then <laughs> I know we talked about this when we were up in New York and right around started Indie Bio, I became a father. So it was kind of a crazy time of balancing a first baby and also going through the program. But somehow managed to survive, but it was, it was great for us. Like it, it really, really opened a lot of doors and, and made us much more like rigorous and disciplined, I think with, with our, our approach to, to developing the company at this stage. And who are your co-founders and how did you get introduced to them? Yeah. So we have three full-time folks right now, myself and Trevor Ham. Trevor is our CSO. He leads our lab, lab operations we actually met Trevor, put out a, an application for a job just for a tissue engineer. And, and we didn't really intend it to be a co-founder job, but, you know, he applied. We said, wow, this guy's like super qualified and, you know, said, hey, you know, do you want to just lead our, our science operations? And he was like, yeah, let's do it. So jumped all in. And then RJ Savino, also a North Carolina guy. So Trevor's also a North Carolina guy which is where our lab operations are down in Raleigh. He did his master's in the lab of Paul Mosiak. So Paul previously at a piece of meat, which was acquired by stakeholder foods a couple of years ago. So RJ's kind of grown up with a, with a cell ag pedigree and has been, you know, involved in this throughout his master's. So yeah, that's, that's rounds out our, our team. Wow. Cool. Okay. And, and so earlier we were talking about the different approaches that, that companies, cellular agriculture companies are taking, whether they're doing full stack or, or B2B, you know, what, you know, Atlantic, what is Atlantic Fish Co. doing? And other than the white flaky fish, what will be kind of your initial go-to market? Yeah. So our view on this is that you've got to start with hybrid products, something that's hybrid and something that's unstructured. But also with that, and and this was another reason for seafood, we just felt starting with this technology, going after chicken nuggets or or hamburger was going to be really, really difficult. You know, this is assuming any new product that comes to market you're in this technology adoption life cycle where you got to have some people willing to pay a premium. Right. And, and I think that's just so much easier if you start with seafood. So our first demo product is a hybrid deep fried fish nugget. So it'll be part plant based, part fish based. We're going to do an initial demo with that targeting by the end of this year. And then from there, you know, getting feedback, we'll figure out what our first go to market product will be, but it will definitely be something that's that's unstructured and hybrid. Um, still TBD on which of those fish species it will be. We've got several cell lines that we're working on right now, and and whichever is the the best horse, the fastest horse wins, and, and we'll go we'll go with that. In terms of where the startup is at, you said that at the end of this year you might have some sort of sample. Where are you at from a fundraising perspective and and kind of what's next for Atlantic Fish Co? Yeah, so we are in the middle of our pre-seed. We have raised, obviously, from Andy Bio uh, that I mentioned, and we've got some other investors that have come on board, Sustainable Food Ventures, which has invested in a lot of companies in our space and, and a few angels as well. And we're continuing to raise that pre-seed, looking to that to take us through the end of 2024 and then hopefully get through this this very tough time for startups <laughs> with the economy and everybody worried that the recession is right around the corner. But I feel like they've been talking about that for 18 months and it, and it hasn't happened. So 
hopefully we're on the upswing as inflation is coming down here. Now, you interviewed different folks that are in the industry before starting Atlantic Fish Co. A lot of those challenges that companies had, or maybe the the one thing that people always said was the biggest challenge for the industry, that might have might have changed over the last few years. Tell us a little bit about that and also what challenges your team are are currently facing. Yeah. So I think it's kind of like whenever you're at a at a conference or talking to anybody about this, like how long can you go before someone says the word scale? You know, it's 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 generally not that long. It could be a drinking game. But I think right now, you know, initially companies were coming in and saying, Hey, we're working on a different species, right? And 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 that was our initial case, right? We were we were a business case. We weren't founded on a core technology. You know, we've develop the technology after the business case. I think that's just a higher barrier right now, right? Like, you know, people want to see that this can actually scale and this can actually, you know, make a big dent in the the huge problem of animal protein, right? So there, there's always a trade-off there, right? Should they, should we be mo- more focused as uh, as an industry or, or should investors, you know, put more of their capital into plant-based or fermentation solutions, you know, versus going after cultivated meat, which is, you know, raised a lot of money and, and we've now got a couple companies in market, which is great, but like we really need to see more of that. So I think the 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 bar is getting higher. Now that you're working with a team to grow cells and, and scale the technology yourself, how do you feel about how some of the other companies are promoting how far they've come in however amount of time. Do you think that we can, you know, we're, what we're seeing is, you know, 50, 100, 2000 liter plus scale. Do you, you know, how, how do you feel about that? You know, we're, we're early right now, right? We're, we're at bench scale as a, as a pre-seed company, but I want to see those companies, you know, talking about larger and larger scales because that proves that this is technically feasible, Right. And, and that makes sense that the technology is maturing and, and we're getting into into larger and larger bioreactor systems. So, yeah, I, I, I don't see it as much as a, as a competition in the market. You know, maybe a competition for for finite investor dollars is, is where the competition is at. But, yeah, overall, I, I'm, I'm cheering them on. You know, I want to see, you know, more of these products going at, at larger and larger scale so that they're available. Because like, you know, I always think about in the future, let's say Atlantic Fish Co. is successful and we've got our product on a menu at a restaurant. If it's this weird one-off thing that people have never seen before and it's, you know, one thing on a menu, that's harder for us, I think, than if there's several other cultivated products, even several other cultivated fish products on a menu, right? If somebody's feeling tuna that night, you know, they, they get their sushi, maybe they want a white fish the next night, right? So I want these companies to be successful. I hope, you know, every scale that people are talking about is real because, you know, if there's more of these things out there, people are going to be more likely to, to try them not just one time, but, but be repeat purchasers. And that's, that's really what we need. So yeah, I, I hope they hit all those scale marks. I love that. So you can learn more about Atlantic Fish Co. at AtlanticFish.co. Doug, I wanted to ask you, do you have any last insights for our listeners today? Oh, gosh, the insights questions. Let me let me think. I don't think I do. Yeah. <laughs> no, and, you know, that's totally fine. You know, it's funny because every time I ask, I ask that, I think, wow, like we've been recording for 27 minutes now. I'm thinking, how did 27 minutes go by that fast? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> awesome. Well, Thanks so much for for joining us on the show. I'm really excited to see where Atlantic Fish Co is is going and and you know, I'm really excited for when you your team has the first tasting. Alex, thanks so much for having me on. This was great. I've listened to your show over the years a lot. It's it's kind of strange to be on this side of the of the mic being <laughs> interviewed for for one of these and and in particular here on on your show. So this is this has been awesome for me and 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 thank you so much. I, I really really appreciate this. Thank you. This is your host Alex and we look forward to seeing you on our next episode. 